Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Training Accreditation Council TAC webinar on assessment in the workplace. So this particular webinar is, as I said, assessment in the workplace, and it is one of our new workshops, and it forms part of the Training Accreditation Council's education program. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, which is the Wajak people. We wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. So now I'd like to introduce Russell Docking, uh, who is our presenter for today. And Russell has been an auditor for TAC for quite some time and is well acquainted with the standards, in particular assessment in the workplace. Thank you very much, Russell. Thank you very much, Mel. And may I say uh, welcome to everybody. It's really good to see so many uh, uh, smiley emojis and uh, and also so many people participating today. Really good to have you with us in this workshop. Uh, assessment, of course, is an is a continuing issue, continuing issue in uh, in the vocational education and training. And indeed, recently, uh, TAC has launched a snapshot of compliance trends. Uh, as of June the 2022, uh, and um, disturbing uh, to see that uh, compliance with Clause 1.8, which relates to assessment, is still at a worrying level. It's it's as high as 69% uh, uh, compliance, but it's the uh, the 30% or 31% that are, are still having issues with this that uh, prompt us to pay a lot of attention to assessment in these education programs. Uh, our topics for today are, um, are, first of all, to look at workplace competencies and what that means in relation to assessment. Uh, then look at the relationship between RTOs and workplaces and how that relationship can be strengthened and enhanced so that uh, assessment in the workplace can function effectively. Uh, that takes us on to look at roles and responsibilities of the various parties, uh, you, yourselves as assessors and those in the workplace who, on the most part, will be observers or evidence gatherers, but not actual assessors. And we'll come back to that discussion a bit later on. Uh, of course, assessment in the workplace means that it's uh, not the kind of controlled and contrived environment of a, of a campus-based assessment. And so learners need particular kinds of support uh, so that they can participate effectively and fairly in the assessment process. So we'll look at uh, learner support and finally finish with continuous improvement. But before we move on, I just want to reflect on the fact that assessment in the workplace actually has a long history uh, because prior to the 1900s, apprentice training was, was all workplace based. So the, uh, the, the apprentice would uh, experience um, through observation and through conversation uh, the, the art, if you like, and the craft of their trade. And they would be assessed by their supervisor. Uh, and at the end of the process, once they had completed their indenture, they would be able to be qualified as a tradesperson in their own right. So assessment used to be uh, pretty well entirely within the workplace. Uh, in the early 1900s, TAFEs took over apprenticeship training uh, and an assessment moved to the campus. Uh, and that had a consequence because uh, the opportunity for uh, activities that involved the skill performance within the, on the campus were, were limited. And so the focus tended to move towards knowledge-based tests. And indeed, by the sort of mid-1990s, um, uh, what you found was assessment was pretty well entirely uh, knowledge-based and, and a bit later on, almost entirely multiple choice-based. Uh, by, by the late 1990s, industry became increasingly dissatisfied with TAFE. Um, and, uh, for example, uh, uh, what, the WA TAFE Apprentice of the Year uh, one year was failed by the trade examiner. In other words, they were really good at their multiple choice tests but we're not really good with the tools of the trade. Uh, and that prompted the department, then Department of Employment and Training in uh, Western Australia uh, to have a close look at the, uh, the, the problem. There were industry advisory committees uh, made up of unions and employer representatives, 
Uh, but they had all deserted those uh, advisory committees and we found that the advisory committees were made up entirely of TAFE staff who basically had lost touch with what was going on within the world of industry. And in 1986, I conducted a review of apprenticeship assessment which found a multiple of flaws in assessment by trade examiners and by TAFEs, due in part to the lack of outcome standards and to the lack of qualified assessors. And that led in 1987 to the development of competency standards for 125 trades and in turn to competency-based training and assessment, which had a whole bunch of consequences. One was, that first, that units of competency were defined by industry. Up to that time, uh, the standards were defined as curriculum by TAFEs. But now we had industry actually defining the competency standards, and we see that still, still sustained through the idea of training packages where competencies and qualifications are defined by industry. Um, TAFE was then required to meet those industry standards. So it was not TAFE setting the standards now, it was industry setting the standards. And uh, shortly afterwards, competency-based traineeships were launched to expand beyond the trade areas to cover a whole range of qualifications outside the trades. And trainer and assessor qualifications were uh, developed and designed. And indeed, train RTOs, registered training organisations, began to come into being along with standards for RTOs, which now talked about uh, industry engagement, talked about industry competency standards, talked about trainer and assessor qualifications and the like. And what we found was that the workplace was then restored as a legitimate setting for assessment. So in the past, it was asserted that assessment in the workplace couldn't be as good as assessment in TAFE. But now the question is, can assessment in an RTO be as good as assessment in the workplace? There's been that quite significant shift. So we, and we see that shift also when we start looking at uh, what training packages are asking. Uh, so many units of competency now specify the workplace as the preferred setting for assessment. Um, and uh, they may say, well, if you can't do all the assessment in the workplace, then simulation might be acceptable. But what we're seeing now is a, is a strong push in the specification, particularly in the assessment conditions part of a unit of competency uh, for the workplace as the preferred setting. Uh, some, sometimes it's expressed uh, not so much as a preferred setting for assessment, but sometimes they require a good deal of time in the workplace. Uh, with assessment in the workplace as an option. In other cases, they see the workplace as just a place to be immersed. Uh, and so the workplace is accessible for assessment, but it's not mandated in the unit of competency. So we have the whole spectrum where some units are saying you must assess in the workplace through to you can assess in the workplace. Um, but more and more we're seeing the workplace being engaged as part of the learning and assessment process. So uh, this is an indication really that um, it's become, become understood that the workplace is a really good place to assess. Indeed, it could even be argued that it's the best place to observe a competency. And that's in part because, as I mentioned before, the competencies themselves come from the workplace. So since competencies are derived from the workplace, it's logical to, to realise uh, that the workplace is a really good place for assessment, but it does need to be managed in a in a, uh, a way which gives us quality. And there, of course, we have the rules of evidence to uh, to guide us. Um, uh, but sometimes the workplace is not ideal. And when it's not ideal, uh, then most units of competency will say that a simulated workplace can be used. And that could be because the there's aspects of the competency which are very expensive to observe, uh, might be very much uh, niche aspects, in other words, not found in all workplaces, or it might be that they're dangerous and risky. Um, under those circumstances, if it's expensive or risky or rare or seasonal, um, what you could do in those circumstances is in, uh, use a simulation of a workplace. It is not saying that the whole assessment can be simulated. What it's saying is parts, those parts that are expensive or rare or, or uh, seasonal can be assessed through simulation.
and the requirements for simulation are strong and they relate to what uh, are called the dimensions of competency, which is basically saying the actual skill itself is performed um, uh, rather than some sort of pretend performance. So if you're working with a lathe, you really work with a lathe. Uh, it won't be it won't be virtual. It won't be on computer, but it will be actually using the tools. Uh, the second is that the skill is performed along with other skills, because in a real workplace, you rarely perform a skill on its own. You normally perform a skill in association with other skills. So you have to be able to prioritize and coordinate the, a range of skills simultaneously. Um, in a real workplace, things go wrong. And so in the simulation, problems have to be encountered. So you have to create problems for the person to demonstrate their capability of coping with them. Uh, and uh, finally, the, the skill had to be performed in a setting which has all the complexity of a workplace. Workplaces are not hygienically uh, uh, cl and clinically managed. They are slightly chaotic environments. Uh, and so your simulation has to reflect that kind of complexity uh, in order for you to be able to say, a person who has demonstrated this quality in a simulation um, would actually be able to demonstrate this quality in a real workplace. Uh, so it's really important for us to understand that either its assessment happens in a workplace or in a simulated workplace. But it's always important for us to remember that fundamentally uh, all our VET skills are fundamentally workplace skills. And therefore we need to make sure that when we come to assessment, uh, we reflect that quality. I do need to stress, though, that um, given that a unit of competency is made up of skills and knowledge, uh, that knowledge can be assessed really anywhere because knowledge is basically assessing what's in the mind, if you like, of the learner. And you can assess that very comfortably on campus through short answer questions uh, or through either issued orally or in writing. Um, uh, but when it comes to skills where that person is actually utilising the, tool, the tools of the trade, uh, if you look at those dimensions of competency on the slide in front of us now, uh, you can see that um, either you have to have a very sophisticated setup on campus or go into the workplace where the actual skill is performed, where it is actually performed along with other skills, where problems are naturally encountered and dealt with and where the skill is happening in, the, in an environment which has the complexity of a workplace. So what we're focusing on really here is assessment of skills in the workplace because we know we can assess knowledge in other contexts. Assessing in the workplace, though, does require us to establish strong cooperative relationships, uh, and those relationships could be bet need to be between assessors, RTOs and workplaces. And in the next slide, we'll talk about learners, employers, RTOs and industry. But as an RTO delivering VET competencies to learners, you represent workplaces in the industries that utilise those competencies. So it really becomes critical that you, you engage closely with industry, and that is re reflected in Clause 1.5 of the Standards for RTOs and maintain your current industry skills, which are reflected in clauses 16B and 113B, so that your training content and assessment resources will be relevant to industry. And that's the requirement of standard of clause 1.6A. Uh, and now this is all discussed in a fact sheet, which Mel has just put up to you in the chat box, which is the a vocational competence and industry currency, and also another fact sheet which relates to industry engagement. Those are really important uh, fact sheets for you to access to encourage that development of your, your connection to industry. Because at the end of the day, industry must be confident that you are up to date if you are going to have an effective and cooperative working relationship with them. If they think that you're naive and, uh, and out of touch with industry, then it's going to be very hard for you to build strong cooperative relationships with industry. When it comes to learners uh, and uh, employers and RTOs in industry, part of the build, building of the strong cooperative relationship is to understand that, the, that there are lots of benefits that can be achieved through this relationship. Uh, for example, trainers and assessors uh, can maintain their industry skills. 
so that when you go into a workplace to observe a student or to assess a student in the workplace, spend some time in the workplace looking at the workplace for your benefit. So it's not just the benefit of your learner, but there's also your benefit because you can learn from that workplace about new practices, new processes, new equipment, um, uh, and, and new products and, and outcomes. So you can maintain your industry skills. And there I say, when it comes to standards 1.5 and 1.6 and 1.13b, when you're talking about maintaining your current industry skills, you can cite the fact that you've been into the workplaces, uh, various workplaces where your students have been located uh, and that through those contacts with industry, you've, you've enhanced and maintained your industry skills. Learners also get a benefit from it because they get to experience the real world of work. Uh, and for many learners who have been entirely campus-based in their training, uh, going into a real workplace can be a bit of a shock. Um, they discover all sorts of pressures and uh, complexities that they would not have seen when they were on campus. So uh, that, that gives them a real good, uh, really good uh, sense of what the work involves in a real workplace. Employees learn about national standards, and this may seem odd, but I've noticed this in a number of cases, and um, in many cases looking back to a, a program that I was involved in developing training in retail and commerce, that when the students were placed in, an, in a shop or in a business, um, the employees, the other employees who were not trainees, uh, learned a great deal about national standards and indeed the quality of general quality of work in the workplace was enhanced because these employees were involved maybe as observers, uh, but maybe just because there was training going on around them, they began to learn much more about the business in which they themselves were immersed. And so there's a big benefit for employees, other employees, having trainees uh, on site because they learn a lot about national standards and new strategies for the performance of their work. Employers get a chance to headhunt prospective employees, and it's very common to find uh, that students who have been placed with a, in a workplace ultimately get a job in that workplace because the employer has had a chance to see them in that real workplace uh, environment. If you like, it's a, a very extended uh, interview process through which they can understand the qualities of that individual. RTOs get access to resources that are hard to duplicate. And indeed, the natural environment of the workplace involving as it does those pressures and, and unpredictable requirements of clients and all of the sorts of um, complexities and variations that you find in real workplaces, that's hard for you to duplicate. Uh, and indeed, there might even be equipment that you find hard to duplicate on campus. Uh, so you get access to resources that um, you might otherwise not have a chance to use. And finally, industry gets to see its national standards in action. What that is also saying that industry gets confidence and in the credibility of the training and certification that you as an RTO deliver. Uh, and that is all strong uh, uh, contribution. So that adds to the cooperative relationship. If everybody can see that they're winners uh, from that process, uh, then that's a good thing. Going back to that example that I mentioned before in retail and commerce, uh, it was a program in New South Wales called Track Training in Retail and Commerce. Um, and uh, I think we had uh, T-shirts uh, for the students uh, saying that they were part of the track program, but also the shopkeepers were able to put on their window that they were a track organisation, that they were part of the training in, re in retail and commerce uh, uh, activity, and they were proud of that fact. And so it actually became something that uh, that training or that training organisations and and employers and workplaces engaged with those training organisations were able to build that strong cooperative relationship and pride in what they were doing. All that comes down ultimately to a kind of sequence of steps that you need to follow. Uh, the first is that you need to make sure that everybody understands what this is all about. So you need to develop a shared vision uh, so that the, the workplace and the RTO share the same vision in terms of purpose 
and, and expectations from the process. Uh, you need me to establish clear roles and responsibilities uh, so that it is clearly understood through commitments, understandings, planning and agreements exactly what role the RTO would play and what role the workplace would play. You need to agree on clear ground rules so that times, uh, costs, any costs involved, uh, communication, pathways between the RTO and the workplace are well understood. Uh, reporting requirements and commitments were well understood. And you need to make sure that the, there is a, a regular communication maintained so that you are not just leaving the student in the workplace and walking away, uh, but fundamentally what you are doing is integrating yourself with the workplace uh, so that there is strong feedback so that you, you can make suggestions and they can make suggestions and changes can be made to make sure that the relationship is always on solid ground and that the outcomes are what you will be, be hoping for in relation to the uh, uh, the outcomes of, of engagement for workplace assessment. Hi, Russell. Uh, just Mel cutting in here. Before we move yes. on to the next slide, we've got a question from Mark Martin. This is actually, he's asking, what about documentation of these visits? And he's referring to the trainers and assessors maintaining their industry skills. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Mel. Uh, yes, I think the thing about it is that um, I, I would uh, personally, and this is an opinion, I need to say that this is an opinion, I don't think you need to write a diary uh, which says on such and such a day I went into such and such a workplace and I uh, and I spoke to this person and I uh, learned these lessons uh, from the, from that conversation. That could end up being an, an enormously a uh, complex log, and indeed it can dis distract you from the, the process because you're so busy writing things down that you actually don't get to see what you need to see. Uh, my opinion is that you would basically make notes uh, as you leave the organisation while it's fresh in your mind of things that you've seen which were good uh, that you might want to share with your students and uh, things that you've learned that you didn't know before. Uh, and things that you saw that were not good because uh, sometimes you learn from uh, interacting with the, with the workplace that there are things that you'd rather not happen uh, that are not consistent, for example, with the standards. Um, and again, that is something that you might need to share with your students. Obviously, you don't say, oh, I was in such and such a workplace and I saw them doing this terrible thing. Uh, but what you can say is I have been in workplaces and quite often, for example, they don't use the right PPE or something of that kind. Uh, now, what you are doing basically is building up a little narrative. About every six months or so, I would run over my notes and create a little narrative, a little a little uh, paragraph or so, which says, this is what I've learned in the uh, last six months. This is, these are my, my experiences. You might then want to share them with your colleagues because if they're sharing their observations with you and you're sharing your observations with them, uh, then you're going to get a lot of um, uh, of value from it. Uh, but of course, then you need to make sure that your observations and experiences uh, and combined with your colleagues end up influencing what's in the content of your training delivery and maybe then also impact on your assessment strategies. So it really is important that you don't turn this into a monster uh, by trying to maintain a minute by minute log. Uh, but it is really critical that you do retain the learnings and the ideas, uh, something that you can then come back and document and include in your CV or include in your um, trainer matrix in some way or other so that it's there to be seen as part of two things. One is your continuing maintenance of your industry skills, but it's also part of your professional development uh, and therefore is something that is uh, you get a great deal of value from. Thanks for that question, Mark. So when it comes to clarifying roles and responsibilities, um, first of all, what you, they need to do, and it goes back to this notion of having a shared vision, is, is that you share the training and assessment strategy. Now, do keep in mind that the people in the workplace are not going to understand a great deal. For example, they're not going to understand what the words amount of training mean. They're not going to understand necessarily the nuances of various training and delivery strategies uh, that you are using. Um, so uh, don't expect them to be fully conversant with what the training and assessment strategy talks about. 
Um, but the, fundamentally, the roles of the RTO, the assessors and the workplace is where, that, the, as is described in the training and assessment strategy, is something that they need to understand. Plan for learners in the workplace. Make sure that their workplace rules and requirements uh, are well understood. So that does mean that you need to you need to know what the workplace's expectations are going to be of the of the learner, uh, so that you can communicate those rules and requirements to the learners. Plan for evidence gathering by RTO assessors, and we're going to come back to this in a moment. But that fundamentally looks at access and resources. Access in the sense that you might be going in, uh, to, or in this case, as you are an RTO assessor, gathering evidence. What sort of access requirements are there? Is there are there PPE requirements? Are there inoculation requirements? For example, if you're going into an abattoir, um, uh, what sort of resources are available in the workplace? What sort of resources will you need to bring? Uh, and, and of course, you will, those resources might well include and would include uh, observation checklists for you to use as an RTO assessor. And then also plan for evidence gathering by workplace observers. Uh, and here you're going to have to ask, well, what sort of expertise do these workplace observers need? Uh, and so for different units of competency, different kinds of expertise will be needed. They need not necessarily have the whole qualification uh, that the unit is part of. Uh, but they would need to have the expertise associated with that unit of competency so they could understand what your expectations were when it came to observation. Uh, and assessment resources, uh, we'll come back to these in a minute, but they would need to be contextualised uh, so that they could be understood by the observer in the workplace. So if the workplace had particular terminology, um, uh, particular kinds of equipment, uh, then you would contextualise the assessment tool so that the uh, observer in the workplace would know exactly what you're talking about. And there is a fact sheet for you to access um, on assessment in the workplace, which picks up on these issues a little further. But the role Hi, Russell, need to we be have a question really. from Alvin saying, I'm a trainer and assessor for automotive mechanic in an international school. In my case, how can I maintain my industry currency as a mechanic? Do I need to work as a mechanic and as a trainer? Uh, the answer to that, Alvin, is no, you don't need to go put on the, your your, uh, your uh, overalls and go and work as a mechanic. Uh, but what you do need to sp do is spend a good deal of time where mechanics are working. Um, so uh, automotive mechanics are working. Um, so And, of course, within the context of auto mechanics, there's a huge range of variation from uh, small local garages where things are done in a uh, uh, um, perhaps, I uh, dare I say, a slightly more primitive way through to very sophisticated, high-tech automotive mechanic environments. Uh, and so fundamentally, you need to be conscious of the whole scope of uh, auto mechanics, which is nowadays uh, quite enormous. Uh, and uh, under those circumstances, you need to visit lots of, uh, of workplaces. Now, if your students are placed in workplaces, that gives you entree to those workplaces. Uh, but you do not need to work as a mechanic in order to sustain your current industry skills. Um, so it's it's that it, you. I mean, clearly, if a, a bit of new technology comes into play, quite often when new technology is introduced, the the uh, the uh, people that sell that new technology offer short training courses. You might take those short training courses in order to keep up to date uh, with that new technology. Uh, but on the most part, you don't need to return to work as a mechanic. What you do need to do is to return to the workplace as a mechanic. And in that sense, you bring your expertise as a mechanic to interpret and understand and ultimately to describe uh, what you've seen. Uh, and that way you keep up to date. Um, it, it would only be in circumstances where you felt that you were beginning to lose your skills, uh, that you would need to perhaps spend a bit of time uh, with practising the, the utilisation of the tools of trade. Uh, but it would not necessarily be an expectation of you that you work as a mechanic uh, as well as as a, as a trainer. When we start looking at the roles and assessors uh, and evidence gatherers, we need to see that there is quite a strong distinction uh, between assessors and evidence gatherers, although you as assessors uh, can be evidence gatherers, of course, as well. 
Um, so we perhaps need to think of uh, the assessor role, which is, in a sense bookends the process. That as you as an assessor, you develop an assessment mapping through which you demonstrate that the assessment tools that you're using are compliant and consistent with the unit of competencies requirements. You design assessment tools which uh, reflect the rules of evidence in terms of being uh, valid and uh, provide you with sufficient information that is authentic and current. And you manage the evidence gathering process, which would may be, in a sense, managing yourself because you may the, be the evidence gatherer or managing other people who could be colleagues or who could be people in the workplace. At the end of the process, you collect the evidence. You gather all the evidence together for an individual student about an individual unit of competency. And on the basis of that evidence, you make an assessment judgment. And remember uh, that there are two judgments you're making. One is, is the evidence itself credible uh, and, and, and can be used? In other words, does it meet the rules of evidence? And then you look at the evidence, the credible evidence, and say, does this evidence show me that this individual is competent or not? That's a special call that you make. When you make that assessment judgment, you're making the most profound judgment you'll ever make because you're impacting on that individual student's future career, you're impacting on that future that student's future employers, and you're impacting on the clients of that employer or that uh, students uh, in if they're self-employed. Um, uh, so you're making a profound judgment when you make that assessment judgment. And to do that, you have to be a qualified assessor, all of standard 113 and 114. You report the assessment outcomes uh, to the RTO so that they can issue a statement of attainment or ultimately a qualification, and you participate in assessment validation. I say participate because uh, as the assessor, you are being validated under standard 1.9 through to 1.11, you are being validated, so you don't lead the validation, you participate in the validation. Uh, between that role of setting up the system on the left and managing the evidence on the right is the gathering evidence process itself, which could be done by you or it could be done by somebody else. The, the person in the middle then gathers the evidence and they're gathering the evidence using the tools that you designed. They report the outcomes of the evidence to the assessor. They're not reporting judgments, they are reporting evidence. So they are simply saying, this is what I saw. And then they participate in assessment validation because they need to be, we need to confirm, uh, and you need to confirm that they are uh, carrying out their responsibilities in gathering and reporting evidence in a way which is consistent with the requirements. Um, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a minute, uh, because these are, if you like, third party observers, or third-party evidence gatherers, and their role needs to be closely managed. Keeping in mind that these third-party observers are in a workplace, so they have a job already, uh, and that they are committed to carrying out and responsible for carrying out their job, um, uh, what you need to do is uh, make sure that what you're doing is, is managing your interaction with them in a way which gives you quality information uh, so that you can make meaningful judgments as an assessor. So first of all, you need to be confident, confident that they are suitable observers. And that means that they will need to have vocational skills relevant to the things that they are observing. So just keep that in mind. They don't have to have the whole gamut of skills that you have. They have to have the vocational skills that are necessary for the observations you're asking them to make. Uh, the second thing is that you need to make sure that the tools you're giving them to use, the observation checklist, are suitably contextualised so that they will understand them. And it's not saying that they are ignorant of standards. What, I'm, what it's saying is two things. One is that the units of competency as they're written are kind of generic statements which you are specially trained to interpret, but they are not trained to interpret. They haven't done their TAE. They haven't uh, been through the sort of processes you have. Um, and so you need to contextualise the observation tools so that they know what to look for. You need to make sure that they've got clear instructions so that they stick to the script and don't deviate. One of the big problems that we have with third party observers is that they often know too much in some ways and start imposing their own expectations and standards rather than reflecting the standards that are required uh, through the training package. 
So you need to make sure that the observers are properly briefed so that having prepared instructions, you now debrief them. What are the RTO standards, particularly the rules of evidence? Uh, and uh, the, they need to understand this notion that they need to make direct observation rather than inferring uh, from uh, some sort of final product uh, what has been done. You need to make sure that you manage observation records, uh, that you monitor observers, uh, and that you engage observers in validation and uh, potentially at audit, both internal and external audits may well involve you connecting with um, uh, with um, uh, uh, the, the workplace observers. Joel has asked a question, uh, does a, a, a gatherer need to have, or beg your pardon, Clive asked the question, uh, do you need to have a TAE? And the answer is no, uh, they don't need to because they're not assessors, um, they are observers. So well, they're merely acting as evidence gatherers or as observers, so they don't have to have a TAE. Um, uh, what you're going to do is structure things so that a TAE is not necessary through observation tools that are contextualised and through careful instruction. They are just your eyes and ears. They are not making a judgment, either in terms of what to assess or how, whether what, what the assessment means. That's entirely in your hands. Um, uh, and Joel asked the question, when we are assessing in a workplace in a very sensitive environment, for example, the police, can a state assessor just state observed evidence of CO? The answer is this, that um, uh, what you're observing here is when you're looking at a, a student is whether or not they have demonstrated the quality described in the competency. So you will just, you would perhaps not include um, for the evidence itself that was used to make that judgment. In other words, if they were dealing with a, a, a person in a, a live situation, you wouldn't put in the name of the person that they were dealing with. This is also true for uh, say in community services where there might be confidential um, conversations. Uh, what you are getting from the process is a statement about the learner, not about the situation in which the learner was placed. So what you need to get is observations of the learner, and that is not confidential. It's confidential to the RTO and to the workplace, but, it's, but, but it is not confidential from the RTO. So what you need to do is what comes out of that is a set of observations about the learner, not about the police service or about the, the interviewee or, or whatever. That information would not be available. However, you as an RTO would need to find ways of validating that. And that might be done through having other people who have at, uh, the rights of access to that sensitive environment uh, corroborating the evidence that was derived from the observation. In other words, there are ways and means uh, for dealing with sensitive environments. But do keep in mind that what is taken away from the place is not a reflection on the workplace, but a reflection of the student who is in the workplace. And that really, I think, is important to see. Uh, so then when we come to look at these third party observers, there are some sort of challenges uh, that they all need to, that they will, that you will need to meet. Uh, and for some reason or other, my slide didn't change, now it is. Uh, and what we have here is, first of all, role conflict and confusion. And that is because you are asking the person to be both a trainer, a, a colleague, a mentor, a coach, and an assessor. Well, you're not really asking them to be an assessor, you're asking them to be an observer. So it needs to be very clear that they are not making judgments about the student, simply reporting to you on what they have seen. Um, and you also need to make sure that it's clearly understood by the learner and by the third party that the purpose of the exercise is to enhance the quality of learning and ultimately make a sound judgment about outcomes, uh, outcomes which could lead to supplementary experiences and further training. Um, but there, it is understood that there is this tension between I, I, am I this person's buddy or am I this person's judge? Uh, and so you need to make sure that you're aware of that and try to deal with it. The second thing is time pressures and paperwork. So you need to make sure that you don't end up with a, an observation checklist, checklist which is a, 
a, a huge document. You need to try to either break it down into smaller chunks or you need to make sure that it's a fairly streamlined process. Um, the third thing is you need to watch out for personal standards and expectations and unconscious competence. Unconscious competence is basically saying that quite often uh, people who are really skilled don't actually know what they're doing. Uh, that sounds strange, but they do it unconsciously. They're highly competent. They actually haven't thought about what they're doing. And so they find, might find it difficult to articulate what they're seeing because it's not something that they normally think about. They just do it. And they do it really well, uh, but they don't really know how they do it. Uh, and the same problem goes with personal standards and expectations. They might actually be very conscious of what they regard to be the necessary standards and, and uh, have those expectations of this of your students. And particularly an issue when you're dealing with, say, lower AQF levels, certificates one and two, for example, uh, where people who are acting as observers may up the ante by saying, oh, well, I expect a higher level of performance in the, than this. I expect this person to show more autonomy and more independence. And you have to basically say, no, no, at certificate one and two level, we're not expecting autonomy and independence. These are people growing into the role and they need to be able to work under supervision, but not necessarily autonomously. So one of the things you're going to have to make sure is that it's very clear in your assessment tools and observation checklists exactly what it is you're looking for uh, and ask them to stick to it uh, and make sure that they stick to it. You need to make sure that they don't get caught up in personal opinion uh, versus the objective observation, which is what you want, and comparative judgment. So that if you've got two students in that workplace, one is starring, the other one will look really hopeless, and yet both might be meeting the standards. Uh, so you need to make sure that they don't become a sort of uh, influenced by either previous students or current students and the differences between them. Watch out for leniency, central tendency or harshness and tick and flick. This is basically where people start saying, well, you know, good, near enough is good enough, um, uh, you know, he's a good lad. Um, or we'll, we'll just tick him off. Or while well, he's working about it to the sort of average standard, may not be the required standard, but it's, but, but, but it's a standard that everybody else achieves, so it's okay. Uh, or uh, sometimes you find harshness where the person says, well, you know, th this kid is good, but I can't possibly tick him off as good uh, because that will make him feel uh, overconfident and, uh, and he'll relax too much. Or tick and flick, where they see you coming up the driveway, suddenly realise they haven't finished the form, and they they sit down quickly and tick and flick everything off. So you've got to watch out for those sorts of challenges. Here, say, and fourth party evidence. It's really critical that your observers actually see what the student is doing and, and are not doing it on the basis of what someone else has said. Uh, and, in, and likewise, you need to make sure that they fill in the forms as they are seeing it, rather than a couple of days later, uh, because the recollection of that can be, can be very uh, selective. And finally, we need to distinguish between uh, uh, observations which are part of the process of learning, which are formative, versus summative, which is where they're making a declaration which says, this is what I have seen this person achieve. Uh, so that uh, they, they might have gone through a process of of, uh, dare I use the word, incompetence, as they learn the skill, ultimately achieve competence, what you want to see is what they've achieved, they're outcomes based rather than uh, formative based. So, so Russell, uh, Gillian the, uh, has uh, asked a question. Uh, she oh, asks, yes. is it preferable to have the assessor carry out at least one observation or is it okay for the workplace evidence gatherer to carry out all observations? I would say, uh, Gillian, it's preferable to have the assessor carry out one because that actually provides a kind of validation of uh, what the workplace assessor is seeing. But it may be very difficult for you to do that because it may be uh, that they're remotely located, for example, and it's difficult for you to get to where the, the, the learner is. And, and it goes back to that question earlier on asked about sensitive environment. Uh, it may be difficult for you to get in there because it is a sensitive environment in which case it would be preferable to have two different workplace evidence gatherers um, uh, because what you then get is a, what, two evidence gatherers providing independent evidence 
which you can then look for consistency. Um, uh, notice, of course, too, that um, uh, the, the definition of competency talks about consistency. Uh, it talks about transfer uh, and, and, uh, and uh, re- implied in all of this, of course, is retention. So having two different observers um, carrying out observations gives you an indication of consistency, gives you an indication of validity, gives you an indication of reliability, which is a principle of assessment, gives you an indication of retention, and it gives you an indication if the, the task is different, uh, transfer. Uh, so rather than have two observers observe the same task, have two observers in the workplace observe two different tasks, uh, and that way you'll be able to see transfer. Uh, so it is preferable to have you go there, but it, is, it, can't, it can't be necessarily mandatory because you may not simply be able to get there. But what you also have to have is, of course, that notion of, of moderation. And uh, the idea here is, or not so much moderation, of validation. So what you need to have here is this notion that from time to time, you need to try to get some way of validating that third party observer's um, observations. And you'll build up over time a collection of observers that you can trust um, because you have been able to validate what they're doing, either through looking for consistency with other observers or consistency with you. So when it comes to implementing appropriate assessment strategies, and, and thanks for that question, Gillian, it's a good one. Um, uh, you need to make sure, first of all, that your, to- your observation tools are contextualised, which means that you need to be enough in the workplace to know that there is a language of the workplace that is different to the language of the units of competency, and maybe even the different language to the language you used, used in your workplace when you were, were in the business yourself. I use the word language here to talk about mean terminology and phraseology and, and uh, the way in which uh, people operate within that context. I'm not talking about foreign languages. Um, so contextualization means that you change the way it's worded, but you don't change the meaning. Uh, and, and little trivial things like instead of saying clients, you might say patients. Instead of saying um, uh, students, you may say learners. Uh, uh, it, it will just be a slight shift in the language and the terminology so that the, you, the reader of it is comfortable with it. You haven't changed the meaning, but you have changed the words to convey the meaning. You need to make sure that learners are fully informed of assessment requirements, which generally means before work placement, there is a clear statement of of what is expected. Uh, And again, you might distinguish there between formative assessment, that is is observations that relate to to learning the, the skill, as distinct from summative assessment, which and observations, which is where you are basically saying that this is a kind of an expression of the endpoint of all that learning. And you might need to make clear to the learner as well that the assessment is being done by you, not by the person in the workplace. They are not carrying out an assessment, they are observing so that you can carry out an assessment. Uh, You may need to obviously make sure, you would need to make sure the workplace knew about observation and assessment requirements, uh, so scheduling, uh, and it might be that uh, they observe things when they happen, or it might be that they make things happen so that they can be observed. It will depend a lot on what the workplace can manage. Uh, you need to make sure that the workplace resources are suitable, are they right, the right kind of lathes, the right kind of forklifts, the right kind of, uh, of equipment, uh, and do those equipment meet the necessary standards, industry standards? Uh, you need to ask yourself the question, are we going to use natural workplace evidence where where we just wait for the event to happen and then we observe it, or contrive workplace evidence where we make things happen and then observe it. And finally, you need to make sure the workplace is fully conversant with the fact that as they are part of the RTO through this activity, that they are going to need to be involved in assessment validation and feedback. Uh, so, again, re- contextualise the tool to reflect workplace terminology. Make sure that you have mapped the elements of performance criteria, foundation skills and performance evidence requirements. Make sure that whenever you're asking for something in a workplace assessment tool, that it has a reason to be there. 
either it's measuring an element and therefore all its performance criteria, or it's measuring a foundation skill, or it's, or it's measuring a performance evidence requirement. Make sure that there's a clear description of the workplace task to be performed uh, and make sure that there's a clear description of the outcomes or benchmarks to be observed, so effectively a marking guide. Make sure there's a simple process to record observed outcomes, which will be some form of checklist, although um, much of the time you may also need some narrative uh, so that you can look, make a judgment yourself whether that narrative would have led to the same judgment or not so much judgment, but observation that has been made by the person in the workplace. And so you provide an opportunity to write narrative or include photos or video, uh, particularly uh, where unexpected or incorrect outcomes are observed, um, it, because that might be the basis of an appeal. So uh, write narrative generally is a good idea uh, and, and including photos or video where, the, where there's something incorrect uh, can help you with, to make sure that the, the, the observation is fair and meets the rules of evidence. So at this point, um, we're going to ask you to look at a, uh, a sample, which is actually taken from the fact sheet. Uh, we're not complicating things by inventing new ones, so you can reflect on this later on. Uh, and what the assessor is asked to do is to complete the checklist for each learner. If you've seen the learner com complete the task, you can place a tick in the relevant box. If you've not seen them, then please say no or put a cross in the relevant box. And here you can see the assessment tool uh, provided uh, and, uh, and uh, with ticks and crosses and a comment down the bottom saying, good job, Brooksy. What do you think of that as an assessment tool for the workplace? Uh, and Mel has asked you to say, uh, to provide us with feedback now, do we think this example is sufficient as a workplace assessment tool? But what we're seeing is most people are saying no, uh, and about two thirds are saying no, and about one third is saying yes. Let's have a look very quickly at what this has to say. First of all, as a checklist on itself, and we'll move on if we can, uh, as a checklist in itself, uh, it doesn't say, for example, who the student is. Uh, maybe that was somewhere else in the tool, but it doesn't say on this page. It does not say who collected the evidence, so we don't know who the observer is. We don't know when the task was un undertaken. But furthermore, we don't really know w whether proper benchmarks have been achieved. Um, did they identify procedures relating to personal safety? Did they uh, do that with adequate level of precision and the performance? There's not enough information here. So if we now look at example two, uh, and uh, we may find a, that we can't really do a poll on this. What we see here is uh, example two, and it goes over two slides or in our, in our um, fact sheet um, two pages. Again, it says, please use the observation checklist while a learner is completing a maintenance task in the workshop. So now it's very precise about what is happening and they're completing it while a person is doing it. Make sure you include the copies or photos of the documentation listed in the checklist. And so what was the task the learner completed? And the observer, Tim Doll Dewey, has said they dissembled, repaired, and reassembled a wheel hub for a, mach a particular machine. Um, list the documentation accessed, and then each of these things. The learner selected and used the correct PPE for the task. Yes, yes, yes. Include photos of the learner and they're attached. Uh, attach a copy of job, job hazard analysis, JSA, JHA, and attach five safety form, take five safety form completed by the learner. And it's attached at attachment six. And on the second page, you find um, uh, that the, the whole bunch of stuff has been ticked off, uh, except you'll notice that use the measuring equipment correctly and the calculations were made were correct, were not ticked. And so when it comes to feedback, the learner is told uh, specifically about those problems. When using the vernier calipers, you may need to make sure the calipers are perpendicular to the component that you're measuring. Because you didn't do this, the measurement was wrong, and that impacted on your calculations. Otherwise, the task was completed safely and the documentation was complete and accurate. Now, what we get here is a statement about the person's performance. So it's not about the workplace. It's not sensitive information 
about the workplace. It's information about Jim John Jones, the learner, uh, and it, it gives us the kind of information which you and I as an assessor uh, could use to make a judgment. The fact that you ask these questions in the, uh, are because these questions relate directly to elements or performance and their performance criteria or to foundation skills, which might be, for example, the calculations might relate to foundation skills uh, and, and so on, so that there's a rationale behind all of this evidence. Other things that were happening in the workplace at the time are not included because that would distract the observer from the thing that is required by you as an, an assessor to make a meaningful judgment. So we won't, uh, we, you can see that that makes something stronger. And I might say, by the way, that in that example, that there might be other skills that are connected. In other words, that could be a clustered activity um, so that you are seeing not only the skills from a particular unit of competency, but you might also be seeing evidence in relation to other units at the same time. The learner in the workplace, though, is going to need support. Uh, and uh, we have in this slide a list of things that, the, the sort of things that they need uh, to, to know. First of all, they need to know their rights and services and the RTO point of contact. In other words, never forget that the learner in the workplace is still your responsibility uh, and they have still have res responsibilities in relation to you as an RTO. They are still uh, your student. And so they need to be, know how to contact you as an RTO uh, and what their rights and responsibilities are in relation to you as an RTO. But they also now have that added component that they have responsibilities and requirements in the workplace. So there needs to be a proper workplace induction. Uh, they need to know about the personnel in the workplace and their specific roles. They know about workplace safety, security and emergency procedures. They need to know about workplace codes of conduct, policies and procedures. They need to know about the work placement supervisor and their role and responsibilities uh, and the activities that that workplace the supervisor will be expecting of them and the level of participation that is needed. And they'll need to know about work placement feedback review and evaluation. So they need to be fully informed <coughs> about uh, that new role that they've acquired, which is now a, a, as a worker in the workplace, as well as being a learner in your RTO. Uh, and, and so quite often what there is in, 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 with a uh, work placement uh, document is a fairly substantial preamble, which takes them through uh, all of these sorts of issues. Some of these issues will be kind of generic and some of these issues will be unique to the particular workplace. So it may need to be supplemented with information from that particular workplace. So finally, we need to look at two things. One is um, continuous improvement. And it basically is saying that um, continuous improvement stand in, in a stat clause uh, standard two, clause 2.1 and 2.2, basically refers to the fact that you need to maintain the quality of what you're doing in all locations, and that includes workplaces. So workplace personnel need to understand and accept that they need to contribute to the RTO's internal audits and may be involved when the RTO is engaged in an external audit. In other words, they now become, like a student now becomes part of their workplace, those supervisors or others that are providing evidence now become part of the RTO, not in a formal sense, but in a sense that they are now, now contributing to judgments that you're making and therefore they need to have that sense of engagement. Uh, so the RTO is required to gather feedback from the learner, assessors, workplace management and workplace observers, uh, and that is part of standard 2.2. And workplace personnel are encouraged to provide feedback to improve the RTO's workplace assessment strategies. So you want them to become engaged in the, in the quality improvement of what's, what, the, what they're doing. And we'll finish up um, almost precisely at 10 o'clock with the validation exercise and uh, a validation uh, slide, which basically reminds us, and it actually takes us back to a question asked much, uh, do you need to make, uh, do you need to visit uh, to carry out an observation? And the answer is if you can, yes, that's good. That direct comparative observation where you and an observer sit side by side and observe the same performance and see how well you agree in terms of your observations. 
um, or where you get independent observations are compared where where maybe two observers within the workplace are observing the same performance and variations are discussed. Now, the purpose of this process is validation, whereas if you have independent observers observing different tasks, then what you're getting is not so much validation evidence but evidence of transfer. So this would be in a validation activity rather than in a normal assessment activity. An indirect comparison where what you do is look at observations that have been made in the workplace and similar observations made either in other workplaces or on campus or in similar units of competency and look for inconsistencies. If they're wildly different between what is seen and reported in the workplace from what you know from either other workplaces or other activities on campus, then that raises the flag which says, maybe I better have a look and see what, where this variability is coming from. And of course, learner feedback as well. Uh, the final slides are slides that you will be probably familiar with from previous workshops, but we um, uh, uh, have a, a slide here which basically summarizes, sums up where we're at with this workshop. The workplace is the most natural place to assess skills. Simulation can be used to fill gaps if it replicates the workplace. Assessors need to understand current industry practices. A bond of trust needs to be developed with the workplace. Workplace observers are not assessors. Assessors need to manage workplace observers. Workplace observation tools need to be contextualized. Workplace observation tools need to be mapped to unit skill requirements so that they're focused on the unit requirements. Learners need to support when undergoing workplace assessment and workplace assessments need to be quality assured and validated. Uh, we have already made reference from time to time to resources, uh, and here are some resources listed for you to consider. Uh, we draw particular attention to uh, those re the relating to assessment validation, assessing in the workplace, um, but also to complaints and appeals, industry engagement, vocational competency and industry currency, and of course, identifying and meeting learner needs. And finally, we just draw your attention to the fact that if you have further questions, uh, then you can contact TAC uh, and we are provided here with uh, TAC's uh, email address, uh, website and telephone and postal address. Thank you very much for being with us today in this workshop uh, and for your questions and your contribution. Uh, really nice to be with you today and uh, all the best with your workplace assessments in the future. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Russell, for today's uh, workshop. It's one of our new ones, so I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, so, yes, thank you for everyone out there for participating and asking all your questions. A recording of this session and the handouts will be available on the TAC website and on our TAC YouTube channel very shortly. And a certificate of attendance and a short survey will be emailed to you in the next week or so. So once again, thank you everyone for attending and have a great rest of your day.